my idea of growing up and making something out of myself was basically related to uh, not being a burden to my family and to contributing to my family. Being such a flawed individual myself, uh, my, my, uh, uh, um, I have pretty low standards when it comes to the character of the, of the teens, of the individuals. I learned the best, one of the best lessons that I've taken from school in general. The importance of communication. Communication is a basic skill for everything and anything that one wants to do in life. Our region is perfectly positioned to benefit from a near-shoring trend. We need to get our house in order, clearly. Hello and welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Our next guest is an Albanian-born entrepreneur. His professional path is closely connected to Bulgaria, but his impact as an entrepreneur and investor has spread throughout the whole region of Southeast Europe. Elvin Guri is currently managing two venture capital funds, Empower Capital and Invenio Partners, advising and mentoring companies from the biotech industry to healthcare, food and real estate. Elvin Guri co-created Jet Finance, the largest independent consumer lending company in Southeast Europe, which he exited to BNP Pariba in 2007. He holds an executive MBA from the University of Oxford and has supported several educational initiatives in both Bulgaria and Albania, including his alma mater, AOBG, Junior Achievement and Teach for Bulgaria. Elvin Guri, welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Thank you for having me. It has been an absolute uh, pleasure getting myself prepared for, for mm -hmm. our meeting today. Uh, a lot of um, very exciting, uh, like uh, fairy tale stories for people that were ambitious in the Eastern Europe and uh, trying to get better education. So you're uh, standing out in this um, uh, like Western to Eastern transition from Albania to Bulgaria, <laughs> not the other way around. Uh, but I would like to start with your um, professional journey. You realized that you wanted to have your own business during the time that you were in school. But um, what was your childhood like in Albania and what were the factors that determined then you eventually go down the entrepreneurial path? I wish I had the powers of retrospective that would allow me to, uh, to pinpoint the factors that pushed me towards the uh, uh, working for myself route. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think I have those. But from what I can remember from my childhood, um, I had a pretty decent and uh, you know uh, uh, happy childhood, despite all the difficulties that uh, Albania was going through, especially during the 80s, where basically the whole country was uh, vegetarian for most of the time. We had food rationing and. Uh, we were depraved of uh, many of the basic necessities. Uh, however, we, uh, 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 we did not have a good sense of uh, what the world was like until we started, the country started opening up. And even then, uh, um, our idea of what the West or what the world uh, looked like was very, uh, 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 very disjointed and uh, uh, very skewed towards uh, what the movies, uh, Hollywood movies would show us. Uh, and Italian TV and the uh, TV of former Yugoslavia. So uh, uh, in that sense, uh, the, uh, my idea of growing up and making something out of myself was basically related to uh, not being a burden to my family and to contributing to my family. Um, over time, this developed into this almost obsession of working for myself. And rather than factors, I'd point out mostly to personal deficiencies that uh, suggested, hinted very strongly that uh, I'm not cut out to work for large organizations or for office work. I'm not systematic. I'm not well organized. I tend to procrastinate. Um, I tend to think more than do. Uh, and therefore, in order to succeed, I operate much better in smaller teams where we can create an interdependence and rely upon each other. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's what happened in real life. Um, 
most of these lessons, though, I sort of uh, learned by doing. All I knew was that I, I shouldn't be afraid of, uh, of trying. At the end of uh, this uh, brief description of what your strengths and weaknesses are, I was expecting that you say, I'm more into like, let's do it, like courageous, let's, let's go. Uh, and I didn't expect you that thinking more than doing. Mm. Because I recognize myself in this uh, same description. I'm not very um, much into follow through. I procrastinate. I do all these things. Sometimes um, my strength is in just trying things that other think are too scary. Isn't it entrepreneurship? What is like the courage? The courage is in the heart of. No, uh, at it? least for me. And this is one of my pet peeves in the whole the philosophical discussion mm. of what entrepreneurship is. To me, entrepreneurship is mostly about managing risk. You should be obsessed with uh, uh, identifying the, to use a, a Donald Rumsfeld cliche, known uh, unknowns and unknown unknowns. And, and to prepare yourself for all eventualities. When it comes down to it, you have to be able to assess the opportunity uh, and price it and determine for yourself whether you are prepared to pay the price. That is the value of the entrepreneurship. Risk taking, most definitely not. All right. At least for most of us who are not who are not genius, you know. Uh, I can't speak as to you know the Elon Musk's of this world because they are out of our ordinary sort of. Uh, mm. Uh, I see how passionate you talk about entrepreneurship. It's a way of life for you. But um, what what I was uh, missing in the previous uh, statement is the responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but having, uh, like thinking about risk means that you take the responsibility for the, the risk that you put yourself and your organization into. Um, how ha has this um, been shaped in your life to be responsible for this. I realized this quite an, like after 30 that I have to evaluate risks when take all kind of decisions in my life. But what about you? It would be nice if it were not too simplistic to suggest uh, that you are either prepared to take responsibility or you should be prepared to take orders. Um, I like the sound of it, but it's not that simple. Um, I started uh, uh, sort of realizing the complexity of this uh, choice because it is a choice. It's not simply something that you're cut out to do. Uh, uh, when I read uh, uh, one of the better, the most famous books of Peter Drucker called on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, where he describes that uh, entrepreneurship is a, not a character trait. It's a skill much like a foreign language. You can learn, practice, forget, relearn, and continue to practice. So, in other words, it's about analytical skills and about getting to the decision or to the point where you can make a decision. Am I prepared to pay the price for this or that decision in my life? That is essentially, I think, what taking responsibility means. Um, I can't speak as to most people, but I do believe that uh, our environment, whether Albania or Bulgaria in the early 90s, tended to prepare many of us for this sort of taking responsibility. It was not the case for our, for, uh, our parents and the previous generations who were caught in the middle. But, but for people like us, who had no choice but to fight for themselves, starting from the point of where do I go to study and how do I feed myself while I'm uh, at university, that was, I think, a, a good preparation for eventually taking responsibility mm -hmm. for your life and uh, for your life decisions. Um, at some interviews, you describe yourself as a super lucky guy and uh, a good salesman. I would like to start with how can a guy that's assessing risk describe himself as lucky? Uh, it's, a, it's a flip side of it. It's a flip side of the process because 
if you uh, uh, if you think of life decisions uh, including work mm-hmm. as uh, 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 containing risk unknown known risks and uncertainty mm-hmm. you have to allow for the possibility of being lucky and unlucky that's the idea of uncertainty so it's positive and negative you can it's be both positive ways. and negative and and therefore no uh, no proper risk manager in the wider sense of the word mm. uh, uh, can uh, uh, would uh, would be prepared to uh, uh, dismiss out of hand mm. the element of luck or the aligning of the stars or circumstances to help or uh, to help uh, or destroy a particular opportunity or a particular action great and the good salesman part is uh, something that i would like i would personally think that you're going to go back to uh, describing what entrepreneurship is and probably what leadership is people can teach himself to be a good salesman as well as to be a good entrepreneur a good leader it's not something that it's a personal trait uh, yes it is a skill it is about conviction mm-hmm. uh, it, it, about k- the ability to speak with conviction and it's uh, uh, it's about the ability to present a certain facade that allows you to communicate properly with other people um, it's not about the character i by character i'm an introvert but work and life have taught me to be an extroverted introvert so what about your personal traits how do you um describe them as helpful or uh, you think that this reflection helped you get better because for it, me it, it, it's a process really uh-huh. and it's a process in so far as uh, uh you sh- i don't think one sh- should ever stop reflecting whether it's on uh, uh the imposter sort of syndrome am i behaving the way that i should be behaving do i am i making the right decisions for this position or for this responsibility that i'm taking or for the risks that i'm taking uh but ultimately uh, um i think one has to learn to live with oneself mm. both with the positive and with the negative traits otherwise one can never be at peace i i'd like to think that I've uh, 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 I know myself sufficiently to understand especially what my weaknesses are and uh, to have grown enough as an individual to learn to accept them to live with them and with the consequences and where possible to mitigate them through relationships mm-hmm. with others it's uh there's another book by peter drucker that uh you reminded me here mm. uh it's managing oneself and one uh, he was describing what the mirror test is like living with yourself so can you imagine yourself like looking at the mirror and thinking okay am i the person that i want to be or who am i really yes so, uh thank you and i would like to go towards the your probably is this your first uh, entrepreneurial endeavor the jet finance adventure no uh, i tried a few things earlier uh, okay. the, uh, earlier and uh, they didn't work so you you started uh, your uh, co-founding uh, jet finance and looking back towards this what factors do you think helped you execute this idea to to become so successful I think we're lucky to be good in good times. The environment was such that um the population was not over indebted. The banks were not actively looking to finance the population and mm-hmm. there was a period of growth, economic growth in the country whereby there was a disconnect between the actual capabilities of people people mm-hmm. uh, in other words being able to afford cert- certain things and the way that they saw themselves most people at the time saw themselves as lower middle class whereas in terms of ability to afford certain things and a certain standards of life they were properly middle class 
Our services allowed an increasing number of people to start thinking of themselves as middle class and started uh, and, and to start allowing themselves to aspire for a better life and not simply surviving, mm. which was most of uh, the 90s modus operandi for most of us. Uh, when you put this together with the team that we managed to establish and to create in Jet Finance, uh, then uh, you could say that we had a winning combination. By that, I do not mean to say that we as individuals were uh, were exceptional in any way. Well, apart from uh, uh, my, uh, my partner and co-founder Ivan Hrsanov, who I happen to think that he's an organizational genius, the rest of us were rather uh, average. So the best description that I can give about the quality of our uh, of our team uh, that created and ran and made Jet Finance a success was uh, uh, was something that I read about in a book about uh, Alibaba. An average team doing a first-rate job. We managed to complement each other very well. For a certain period of time, at least. Yeah. Um, just before the global financial crisis in 2008, you exited to BNP Paribas. Um, can you share some of your takeaways in this experience and uh, what kind of suggestions or recommendations would you be able to give founders who are considering exiting uh, in the current economic climate? Mm. There, were, there were several factors that uh, pushed us towards uh, the sale at the time. One was that uh, uh, the organization had become increasingly complex. We uh, had reached close to 3,000 people, employees and uh, close associates. Every decision that Ivan and I took reflected on the lives, livelihoods and families of, the three, of these 3,000 people. I personally found it increasingly difficult to handle the responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, so psychologically, both Ivan and I uh, uh, were suffering from it. The second was that the dedication that uh, uh, we expected from our closest uh, team uh, and, and that, the, uh, that the job required was maximal. Mm -hmm. You woke up and you went to bed thinking about work and about the company. W one can handle it when you are 100, 200 people and when you are 28 or 30 uh, uh, years old. But over time, you start thinking that you need other things in your life, family, children, and so on. And after all, there's only so far that you can go by simply reinventing the wheel, which was what we were doing. We had no one to turn to and to ask for advice. How have you addressed this and how have you sold mm. this? But f for a smaller organization, that can be done. For a larger organization, it's more difficult and the room for maneuvering is smaller. And I felt that the pressure on the team was such that we risked disintegrating a major crisis in within the next 24 months. We had lots of debates with Ivan about this, and we felt unsure as to the future of the team. Finally, in November 2006, we became the first company, and so far the only company that has placed uh, bonds in the London Stock Exchange. We collected 75 million euros at, uh, at the sort of terms and conditions that, hand on my heart, I wouldn't give myself that kind of uh, loan. So at one point, uh, we looked at each other, we spoke to the shareholders, and uh, we said, listen, this party cannot go on for too long. Mm. If we're going to exit, we might as well exit from uh, uh, negotiating from a position of strength. And it was a position of relative strength. We were well-funded for the next three years. We were profitable. 
and uh, uh, um, and we were a market leader. All of that helped uh, to push the process forward, and it was a very tight, very efficient process. I can't say what the lessons uh, uh, or uh, what the takeaways could be for people seeking to exit or considering to exit today. Mm -hmm. My first reaction would be that perhaps they've missed an opportunity, uh, but you should never time the market. Good companies can always find investors and can always exit. The rest of us will have to suffer and will have to survive until the tide starts turning. I have a favorite quote that when the tide comes, it lifts the level of the water for all ships. So mm -hmm. we're hoping for a better economic climate in the next in the next years. Um, there, there's always like in, in my head this question. I, I don't know if uh, someone asked you this before, but you said you were close to 3000 people and exiting mm. and you started only four people with five computers. So 13th of November 2001. Yeah, I wasn't still in high school back then. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, who's the fifth computer for? We had a server. So this was the server and for yes, for the server. Awesome. And our organization chart was very simple: one box on top, and then two other boxes below. <laughs> so if I'm producing an organization chart, the second day of the operation. Oh boy! Yeah, I have had the conversations with him. A great person to talk to about business as well. Uh, most recently, you exited uh, Telecom Albania three years after uh, its ex ex uh, three years after its acquisition. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, after the finance and telecom industry, is there another industry that excites you as an entrepreneur and you plan to venture into? Actually, the company is called One Telecommunications. We rebranded it. Second, this was a, a, an investment out of the family office, which mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I managed together. She more than I. My main focus is uh, our private equity initiatives mm -hmm. through uh, through the funds uh, and the family of funds that we have created. So uh, the, the the decision to invest in Albania was partially dictated or uh, motivated by the desire of doing something back home. And it's not so much about the industry as it was about the particulars of the company. The disconnect between the fundamentals and the actual performance. In that sense, I'd say that uh, um, I only have one favorite industry and that's financial services. That's my first love. Everything else is more of a, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, an opportunistic approach. Uh, when it comes to our structured private equity uh, investments, there we have certain industries where uh, we have created expertise mm -hmm. and certain affinity over time. But this is something, uh, it's a quality of the team and not uh, of me personally. It is very hard. I think it's counterproductive for anyone who wishes to be in the industry um, to have favorites or, uh, or to look at certain industries with a less critical eyes, eye than otherwise. Because I, I happen to believe that the, the cardinal mistake, the biggest mistake that uh, that one uh, a person in our role or in our position can do is to think what would i do if i were running this company but as an investor you rarely ten, uh, get to run companies you help other people run their companies better mm -hmm. it is not it is not your vision uh, that, that you invest in, you subscribe to other people's vision. Otherwise, you will not be able to be a good investor. Having uh, that thought in mind, we have talked to a lot of investors here on the podcast and um, they say that they invest in founders, not in mm. products. So are there key characteristics that you look for in the founders uh, that you support to your uh, venture capital initiatives? Being such a flawed individual myself, uh, my, my, uh, uh, um, I have pretty low standards when it comes to the character of the, of the teams, of the individuals. We look for quality teams. Mm. 
Outstanding individuals can play and do play a vital role in the founding stage of businesses. However, in our, in our activity, we invest in uh, growth stage uh, businesses where the quality of the organization must become increasingly more important than the quality of the individual that has established or, have, or helped create the organization. It is exactly the moment where you, uh, 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 a company or a rather a, f an, a firm starts becoming institutionalized, bureaucratized, if you will. That is the point where we would like to start investing because that's where we can bring more value. That's great. Um, one thing that's very interesting for Empower Capital is that you're, you're focused on some industries that some consider unsexy, mm -hmm. like in manufacturing and healthcare. Um, previously, you were saying you should not prevent yourself from looking critically at things that you work on and you should not limit yourself to favorites and non-favorites. Um, why did you decide to go with such industries that... The first iteration of our fund, uh, mm. uh, uh, private equity investments, um, involved or included also a very strong element of uh, societal impact, something that continues to be a leitmotif uh, uh, mm. of our operations. We interpreted our mandate uh, from the Jeremy program and the European Investment Fund as not simply investing to make money, but also to seek to contribute to the improvement of the business climate in, uh, uh, in the country. Mm. Therefore, and, and overall society, that's why healthcare became mm. a priority for us. Uh, that's why, for instance, facility management was such an attractive sort of uh, hard to pass opportunity. Not simply because there were the typical, uh, uh, typical sort of uh, industry fundamentals that made them attractive. They existed, but on top of those, there was also this possibility of doing something that had not been done before and that could contribute towards the improvement of a certain segment of society. Mm. In the case of, an, of a, a, a facility management, we bought four companies in the space of 18 months and we merged them to create one of the largest employers in the country at that time, 2,600 people, employing or tending to employ uh, uh, people from underprivileged uh, strata of the society uh, with less access to education and from the minorities. Most of the industry at the time and today tends to operate on the wrong side of the law. Salaries under the table, not paying social security. And while the whole time complaining that you cannot trust these people and you cannot because they don't work with quality. If you treat these people not like people, you cannot expect anything good from them. Taking this opportunity to do something the right way was hard to pass, really hard to pass. Mm. And the same goes for healthcare, where the, the case, the society case is very obvious. We helped finance the launch of uh, the first uh, um, cancer treatment center in the country in 40 years and one of the most modern in the region. Great. You said impact and one thing comes to mind, of course, after the word impact and society is uh, education. Mm -hmm. You're also investing in educational initiatives like Junior Achievement, like Teach for Bulgaria, your alma mater, the American University in Bulgaria. Um, what kind of change you would like to see with this long-term long -term investment strategy? Because it's uh, education, the results are uh, picked in years, in decades maybe. 
Okay, uh, I understand. Um, well, on top of the American University in Bulgaria, yeah, I... uh, junior achievement in Bulgaria and Albania, uh, early days of Teach for Bulgaria. More recently, um, uh, we've also started to work with the American University in Kosovo. I would take issue with the uh, uh, with the definition of the question as a uh, as an investment mm -hmm. uh, activity. I'm not approaching this as an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's merely a realization that we have no chance as societies to progress until and unless our best and brightest, regardless of their economic background, get a chance and access to good education. And the institutions and the organizations that my wife and I support help create that sort of access and those sort of opportunities, mm. similar to the ones that we ourselves got once yeah. upon a time. So to me, it's mostly about being able to live in a more, uh, or helping to create a more equitable society, rather than anything to do with, with an investment. You know, in Bulgaria, investment and investing in the future doesn't mean uh, wait, waiting to have a, a like cash out, out of, in, in, as a result, but investing in uh, something that's um, coming to the whole society is going to profit. So impact comes to mind, of course, this is what I meant. We've been lucky to be in a position to assist so far close to 400 students mm -hmm. at the American University in Bulgaria and the American University in, uh, of Kosovo. Um, it's rather marginal considering both the scale of the challenge mm. and the needs of the society. We'll continue doing as much as we can for as long as we can. How do you think that our schools and universities can produce more problem-solving individuals more responsible individuals. Mm. That's a topic for a very long conversation. <laughs> we will invite you again. I am, uh, uh, but in short, I am. My bias here is towards um, liberal arts education mm -hmm. uh, of the sort or, and of the kind that is taught at the American University in Bulgaria or the American University in Kosovo, because it tends to prepare or to produce more rounded people, well-rounded people, versed in, uh, 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 versed in uh, uh, or prepared for all sorts of situations. Um, I will not forget the first, uh, I had to take an anthropology course at AUBG because it was part of the requirements. And as a student, when you are 18, 19 years old, you tend to choose courses according to the uh, necessity and according to the level of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Uh, the easier the better, in other words. Uh, anthropology sounded easier. It turned out to be a lot more interesting than any course that I could have taken in uh, economics or business administration because I learned the best, one of the best lessons that I've taken from school in general. The importance of communication. Communication is a basic skill for everything and anything that one wants to do in life. We communicate in our private lives, we communicate in business. If we cannot get that right, nothing else really uh, works. And most importantly, as a corollary to this, we need our communication skills, especially with those people, individuals or organizations with whom we do not get along or we don't like. Because with people that we like, it's easier to find a common language, even if you're not in, in, in your best shape, even if you're not in your best mood. Mm -hmm. However, with people with whom you have major differences, you need an effort. And that's where communication skills, the, capability, the ability to establish a basic level of trust that allows you to start building upon language, is crucial. That's why liberal arts for me are a lot more important these days for problem solving, complex problem solving, than pure technical skills. 
Having said that, I do not in any way wish to dis or dis uh, or or, or uh, you know uh, uh, diminish the value of uh, STEM education. Mm-hmm. Oh. I just have an issue with uh, uh, um, with the thesis that uh, training more software programmers b- uh, will solve our problems. Mm-hmm. We need more than good professionals. We need good citizen. And liberal arts is fundamental to good citizenship. Great, yeah. I've talked to a lot of people, even like, you know, Vasil Terziev and the founders of uh, mm-hmm. Teleric are also AOBG alumni. Uh, uh, that says it all. Very happy for, for what's happening. And right after Teleric success, we are now um, having a very good harvest. We had the first unicorn in Bulgaria earlier this year. Um, AOBG graduate. Also AOBG graduate, <laughs> Christo is a, a friend of mine. So right now the local VCs are competing uh, for the, let's say, the Bulgarian ecosystem, startup ecosystem is maturing. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you learned so far? You've been into this in this process for longer than like most people that are just starting companies or uh, having capital want to invest in. What can you share on the process so far? I have lots of thoughts on the subject. Um, uh, I think the most the, the most important thing for all of us involved in the industry mm. is that we should realize first that Bulgaria is a small country and a small and limited market. If we are going to produce world-class companies, we also need world-class investors, mm-hmm. funds. We cannot do that by having, by speaking only of a Bulgarian ecosystem. We should be speaking and we should be aspiring towards a regional ecosystem. And I just happen to think that uh, uh, Bulgaria and Bulgarian funds or funds that have generated from Bulgaria, GPT, uh, general partner teams and so on, we have a unique opportunity to uh, to establish our industry as leaders in in the region we have a few years uh, uh, of advantage uh, from some of the neighbor uh, in compared to some of the neighboring countries they're catching up fast but we we still have GP teams here that are into their second or into their mm. third fund so some of the growing pains we've already been through, we are better prepares, prepared for the challenges of uh, you know the next few few years. We need to take advantage of that and help companies become regional leaders. We need to help Bulgarian, Romanian companies to become regional champions, mm-hmm. and that's uh, 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 and then think about you know competing. Uh, that is that is I. I, I of all the uh, sort of professional challenges that uh, uh, I define for my professional career or what remains mm-hmm. of it, um, this is probably the most important one. Because it makes an impact, isn't it? And because I think it's the only way in which we can show that we can do things better at this game than the foreign investors, which is another pet peeve of mine. Right. From your personal perspective, what does it take for these Bulgarian and companies in Southeast Europe to be competing on global scale for market for clients and also for the best talent in the world? Currently, we're hiring mainly home at home. Mm. I think size brings certain benefits. Larger funds will be able to invest in larger companies or help build larger companies that can attract also talent. Um, I would focus more on uh, Bulgarian and regional talent diaspora, mm-hmm. of which we are not short at all. All of the countries in the region, from Romania to Albania and Greece, are basically immigrant nations. So, um, and uh, and most of us 
most of us did not leave the, our countries thinking we're never going to go back. Most of us were forced mm. economic immigrants. Most of us would jump at the opportunity to pursue something worthwhile in our home countries or in the region. Can we work as a team in a way? So it's not only like Bulgaria, only like Serbia or only Greece or Romania. Mm -hmm. It's like the whole Southeast Europe is a, as a hub, as a place. You're speaking about the, uh, the region that put Balkan into Balkanization. <laughs> so uh, I don't think we should hold uh, high hopes on that. Mm -hmm. And it's not simply because we as a region are more sp are special than the others. We simply because of prejudices, became mm. a, a byword uh, uh, for, for such processes. I think more than cooperation, I think we should define what we wish to do as cooperating where we can as much as we can, mm -hmm. competing where we should as much as possible. I think one would gain less by simply cooperating and more by both cooperating and competing. Is there a way that we can push the governments in the region to collaborate on policies regarding like digitalization or research or? BESCO are doing a fantastic job and not just BESCO, mm. but a few other organizations in the, uh, uh, supporting the whole system. Uh, a lot more so than I, uh, I personally could have ever hoped for. Um, now, for, for this sort of efforts to have a certain result, we need to have also a good interlocutor in the other part, the, on the other side. Um, it's a process. It's a process. Um, are there, Elvin, are there opportunities that you currently observe in for the Southeastern European companies um, or the countries uh, to like collaborate on and work on, like just on a business level or industry? I think we're well positioned to ta to benefit from certain trends uh, that have been taking place and have sort of uh, strengthened or slash exacerbated over the past uh, couple of years. One is uh, uh, the the geopolitics, whereby it is not palatable anymore to depend on your supply chain that stretches from China to Europe. Our region is perfectly positioned to benefit from a nearshoring trend. We need to get our house in order, clearly. But we have an opportunity here to start building upon industrial strengths and capabilities that we have traditionally had. That's one. Second, I think we, uh, we, uh, we have an opportunity to start consolidating at a regional level businesses, industries, industries that service local consumption. Not simply working, in other words, for export, but local consumption, retail, manufacturing for the local markets. There are plenty of businesses in quite a few areas that are rather small by themselves and tend to compete in price rather than on quality of services. With scale comes also the possibility to invest, the possibility to compete, to redefine your role in the market. That's where we think through a buy and build sort of strategy uh, as investors that we can bring uh, uh, more value. Uh, it's an amazing that um, a person that uh, got a full scholarship, went to Bulgaria from Albania, developed himself as a, uh, as a student, a uh, student of entrepreneurship, and now is uh, helping the whole ecosystem here shape up, uh, not only the businesses, but the impact on mm -hmm. education in the future. So Elvin, thank you very much for this. As a, a wrap for our conversation, uh, you've mentioned Peter Drucker, one of my favorite. Uh, management consultants and uh, the books that you've read on him I would very much uh, like to have a book recommendation in regards to entrepreneurship by by yourself would you please well, make I'm a, a bit I'm a bit extreme too. there it's not uh, uh, I happen to think that uh, very little of value has been written after Peter Drucker 
uh, but uh, there is one person, uh, uh, a Stanford professor called Jeffrey Pfeffer, who writes on leadership and power dynamics, whose books and teachings uh, changed my worldview. Great. Thank you very much for this. I'll make sure to pay it forward. Thank you for giving back to your country and to your uh, second homeland, uh, Bulgaria. Uh, it's uh, Listen, uh, two-thirds of my, uh, 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 my life so far have been passed in Bulgaria. It's doubtful which one is first and second here. So, uh, But thank you, and I do thank you for the opportunity uh, uh, to have this conversation. It's been great having you. Uh, thank you once again for your efforts, and I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for being with the Recursive Podcast and we'll be very happy to have you next week in our next episode. The Recursive Podcast will be back in January. In the meantime, stay tuned for our holiday specials and catch up with the episodes you might have missed on our YouTube channel. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.